complex legal lie, problem. Okay. Uh, no, the the issue I was running into is as simple as um, by changing my monitors, it's like you no longer have an LG monitor for me to video capture from. I shall default front to video capturing from this other monitor that you had before, but right. I like better. Yep. So I'm like, no, you're not supposed to be doing that corner <laughs> of the screen. You're supposed to be doing this corner of the screen. What are you doing, OBS? Yes. I... <laughs> I I mean, I could, there's no way I could do this with one monitor. I'm amazed anyone who does a live stream with only one monitor. Yeah, yeah. I'm using two mooses. Well, one one elk and one moose. Because I have, I have a 27-inch uh, retina display. Right. And then I have a 4K 43-inch display, right. thus right. elk and moose. Th those are the names of your monitors. It was either that or moose and squirrel. Um, hey everyone, how's it going? If you don't know what this is, you have stumbled into a live episode of Astronomy Cast, and that was us discussing Pamela's cool new monitor. Yes. I'm going to say hi to a bunch of people first. Hello to Arnold B. Uh, sorry, Arnold Post, Astro B, Borg Clan Car, Brooke Mulgata, Capital H, Colin Jones, Frank Tippin, Gordon Dewis, Helg Bjorkog, John Seffield, Quad Libet, Larry Beckham, Lars Ray Jepsen, Linda Sedik, Mr. Tom Harbin, Nancy Graziano, Nicholas B., Paul Gracie, Paul Smith, Peter Quinn, Rick Schwartz, Scott Bragdon, Scott Grease, Side MT, Susie, our producer Murph. Thomas Tranaker, TD, and Tom Van Scotter. Hey, everybody. Welcome to an absolutely regular episode of Astronomy Cast. It feels That's so true. so weird. Don't we feel like we're now we're just like creaking old media here now that you've been doing all this <laughs> Twitch streaming and all this live stuff where you're like out there with the with the kids playing Fortnite and Drake we're, showing up and We're live. I know. We're live on YouTube. I we're know. just we're the older people hang out. I know, but but you, you spend all your time now. You're over with the Twitch people now, so don't forget I, about I, us YouTube stirs. Oh, there there's no fear of that. I just need to get a better schedule going because like every Wednesday, I'm like, what time is Weekly Space Hangout? Can't go live. Okay, cleaning. So oh, so the fact. Aw, <laughs> so you avoid the Weekly Space Hangout. That's oh, nice. Oh yeah, Aww. yeah. No, I don't want to step on you. <laughs> so like, I have this grid of people whose content. I adore that I know I overlap audiences with and you are part of mm -hmm. that. But like and when so, you look at like Skylace, there's no hope. Like you're going to have to overlap her <laughs> live streams, right? She, she and I have actually gotten pretty good at not doing that. Oh, so good. like I'm on all Saturday afternoon and she's on all Saturday evening. And um, yeah, you take care of each other as much as you can in this live world. And the one thing that I wish YouTube allowed that Twitch does really, really well is I have a list on my Discord of everyone who's currently live uh, and streaming. And I can look at it and be like, oh, cool. I'm done recording. I'm now going to pass my entire live audience over to this other person so that they can see what this cool person I like is doing. Yes. It's super smart. That, that yeah. what they call hosting. I forget what they call it. Rating. It's rating. Rating is the name for that. Yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah. But you essentially just like redirect all the people that were watching your show to something else. And I think it's yes. super smart. Um, so we had a bit of a little moment today, and I thought I would just – I'm going to share it at the at the people, but you're not going to be able to see it. But if you search on Twitter for Astro Guys with a Z on Twitter, that's Dave Dickinson's yeah. uh, account. Um, David posted the picture of the book. Excellent. With your name on it. I know. I need to get you the yeah, intro. I know. I know. Here, let me I just know. share this with the audience here. I'm totally not finding this on his stream. Astro... How many hours ago was it? Uh, yesterday. Oh, yeah. If you go I'm... to mine, you can see I reshared it and, and uh, Universe Today shared it as well. So it is called The Universe Today Ultimate Guide it. to Viewing the Cosmos. Everything you need to know to become an amateur astronomer. Uh, written by Dave Dickinson, and I pitched in. So, uh, Excellent. Yeah. And forward by Dr. Pamela Gay. I still need to write that. I'm, I'm, 
Yes. I will remember. We will need the foreword for this book. <laughs> Please. Any, you know, anytime you want. That would be awesome. I, I owe so many people words. Yeah. yeah. Words are hard. Maybe just like do a live stream on Twitch where you write words. No. I've done um, that. It's fun. So, so I'm, I, you and I have texted enough, you know, I'm dyslexic and, and it's one thing for me to be texting with benevolent humans who can be like, why the hell did she put a P in there? That should be a D mm -hmm. um, versus with like the internet. Um, so I show my vulnerabilities in safe places and yes, uh, yes. <laughs> Well, we, we've got an editor. Yes, and and it will get written. It's not getting written live to an internet-based right. audience. Okay. I'm saying if you need like some way, some encouragement, that's uh, yeah, it's a good way to go. All right, well, let's get on with today's episode. Uh, let me know when you're ready to record. And as always, we'll stick around after we do yeah. the show and answer your questions about space and or astronomy. I need to get rid of a window that is telling me to go buy a bunch of books that I'm going to totally take advantage of later so that I can get to all of the notes I took for this meeting. Not meeting. Damn it. I've been in meetings all day, which is why I'm swearing. Um, okay. I am ready to press record and I won't swear while we're recording. All right. I have also pressed record. Hello, Chad. Hi, Chad. I turned off my fish tank. Oh, that was thoughtful. Here we go. Astronomy Cast, episode 492, Comets, Asteroids, and Kuiper Belt Object Update. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts based journey through the cosmos where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. I'm Fraser Kane, publisher of Universe Today. With me, as always, Dr. Pamela Gay, the Director of Technology and Citizen Science at the Astronomical Society of the Pacific and the Director of CosmoQuest. Hey, Pamela, how are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you doing? Doing really well. Uh, we just got the new cover art for the book that we are going to be publishing. It turns out it's going to be coming out on December the 6th. And it's written oh, cool. by Dave Dickinson. And the title is The Universe Today, Ultimate Guide to Viewing the Cosmos, Everything You Need to Know to Become an Amateur Astronomer. And we've got uh, dozens, probably close to 100 different amateur astronomers, including some pictures from you. Uh, you're writing the foreword for the book. Dave Dickinson wrote it. Um, I am sort of helping out behind the scenes to actually bring the book together and coordinate with all of the astrophotographers. So uh, this is, I hope, going to be a really great book. And anyway, so we now see the cover. We know the publishing date. It's, you know, the publisher is, is laying out all the pages. So... I'm sure you'll hear more and more about this book as we get closer to actually publishing it, which is awesome. So, uh, and you know, another reminder, get writing. You've got a, I, I know, got, I know, I know. <laughs> you've got a forward to write. I do. I do. All right. Well, let's get on with, uh, with it. Let's go. Oh, where'd I put it? There we go. <laughs> Uh, so another topic with plenty of updates. Since we started Astronomy Cast, we visited many smaller objects in the solar system up close, from Ceres, Invested, to Pluto, not to mention a comet. What have we learned? All the things. Oh, yeah. So so <laughs> so much for all of those topics when we didn't have a lot of of updates. Now yeah. there's probably no way we're going to be able to get everything compressed into this show. But let's just go quickly. Okay. Uh, so let's start with asteroids. What have we learned about asteroids since, uh, I guess, you know, whatever episode we did asteroids, probably in the low teens. <laughs> uh, so I think the most important thing that we realized, which uh, makes out what I said in the comets episode to be a complete lie, is in our early solar system, things were really hot. The planet Earth got completely baked dry and our, ha our water on our planet had to come from space. And what I said before was all of the Earth's water came from comets bombarding our planet and I was wrong. I was completely wrong. We now believe that the water in our planet Earth probably came from early asteroids impacting our planet, giving off their water and thus, uh, from the delivery of many potatoes became many oceans. So we got our water from 
asteroids from asteroids not comets yeah so this is one of those things that you hear it and you're making the face i know i, I, I can... know i know this is actually kind of new to me and so i'm just sort of trying to process this <laughs> So we've, we've now had spacecraft go out and sample the regular water to heavy water, the H2O to, well, with normal hydrogen to the deuterium 2O water, so heavy water that has extra neutrons. We've gone out and for Comet Haley, for uh, one of the Comet Hartleys, and for Sherry Geary last year, uh, we've measured their ratios and well Haley was like totally off fine move on so we looked at comet hartley and it was like okay this one matches we're good it came from the kuiper belt therefore we shall blame the kuiper belt comets for all of our water but then here we are looking with rosetta at 67 peach cg and its deuterium ratio is off. And what was realized, just like one F in college can totally wreck your entire GPA, everything, even if everything else is all A's and B's, uh, one super high deuterium ratio uh, can wreck your entire ocean's ratios. So even if we run models where Earth was mostly hit by Kuiper belts, uh, Kuiper belt comets, and we assume most of them are like the Hartley that was studied and not like CG67P, um, we can't get to what's actually observed on Earth with comets if any of them have this super high deuterium amount. Now, while a lot of comets are dry, the Dawn mission, which has gone out and given us up close observations of both Vesta and Ceres, found at Ceres that we have a world with ice geysers, with potential ice volcanism that, well, Ceres is not wet with liquid water, but it's wet with ice. And this existence of water frozen into rocks in the past when asteroids hadn't been baked by the sun for as long they probably had significantly more water than they have today and these wetter asteroids when they get sent in on a collision course with the planet earth due to all the gravitational interactions that were going on in the early solar system um, they would have brought that not yet burnt off water to our world to make our oceans and i love that that idea that I guess 10 years ago when we sort of first brought up this topic and I think we've done a whole episode just on where the water came from. Yes. And it was still a bit of an unknown, right? And there was this idea that that the water was just kind of there in the solar nebula and the earth just sort of picked it up. There was the idea that it could have come from the comets, could have come from asteroids, could have come from Kuiper belt objects, but now we've checked. We've gone and analyzed asteroids up close. We've gone and analyzed comets up close. A spacecraft has been to Pluto and, and you know, checked it as well. And now yeah. we found the recipe that matches the fingerprint of water. Well, close. we found the recipe that doesn't match. We know comets don't match, but since asteroids today are generally dry, we can't measure what their hydrogen to deuterium, heavy water to regular water ratio was in the early solar system. And in fact, we haven't been able to sample the water on Ceres yet. So what we actually know is it doesn't come from Kuiper Belt comets and it doesn't come from Oort cloud comets. And all models suggest the Earth would have been baked, and that leaves asteroids. Now, we could still be wrong on the baking part. There are a few theories out there that the water has risen up from the internal mantle of the planet, but there's also all of these awesome papers pointing instead to asteroids of being the origins of our oceans. That's awesome. What's next? Well... We are continuing to learn that the distinction between comets and asteroids is fuzzy. Right. 
we we've found dead comets in the inner solar system that we mistook for asteroids and realized no 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 they they are actually just mostly melted comets that have this nasty layer of what looks like roadway sludge on the surface of the comet and so dead comets master masquerading as asteroids all good we get that um we've now found asteroids or at least an asteroid out in the Kuiper belt, which is not where asteroids are expected to be. So we have this mixing of locations where you occasionally get comets in the inner solar system. You occasionally get asteroids in the outer solar system. And as we look at more and more of both of these kinds of minor planets, what we find is there appears to be a continuum from the I am a rock. I have no volatiles. These these completely dry, rocky things. Cool. And these, I will melt if you put me in the sunshine, icy objects. And this continuum shows us that at a certain level, it's useful for us to distinguish comets, which grow comas and have tails in the inner solar system from asteroids, which are mostly just hanging out waiting to impact us and kill dinosaurs again. Um, this time the dinosaurs might be called humans. Uh, so it's a useful distinction, but what we need to recommend what we need to recognize is these are just the extremes of a continuum where there are objects in the middle. It's just most tend to be at one end or the other. And it's it's really just if you get too close to the sun, you're going to have your volatiles blown away by the intense solar radiation. And that's why we have that that ice line. And that's what that was why Dawn was such a fascinating mission. It was going to yeah. to one object on one side of the frost line, snow line, I forget which which term it is in the solar system. And then another that was on the other side of it to see what is one that was too close to the sun to be able to hang on to its volatiles and what was one that was too far from the sun to be able to hold on to it or or to was lose. too far to lose them yeah and was able to sort of stay fairly fairly frozen um one sort of minor update is that we've found asteroids with moons yes and rings yes <laughs> so like that was yes. unexpected so we had one asteroid with a moon before but now we have several and we're also finding increasing numbers of Kuiper belt objects with moons. And so it turns out that gravity just likes to hold everything together. And even little tiny rocks will sometimes, by which I mean things smaller than a house, but not a lot smaller than a house, um, can find themselves gravitationally bound to bigger objects. Yeah, yeah. So and and you know the way they've been able to find those. I mean, yeah, so many of the Kuiper Belt objects, which we'll talk about in a second, have been found with moons of of varying sizes, which is sort of a, an astonishing piece of science to even be able to find these. You know, Eris has a moon, right? Yes, and it's really far away. So let's talk a bit about then some of the the Kuiper. Did you have any more? Amazing updates in the in the well, asteroid territory. Do you want to move to comets next, and then to Kuiper Belt objects? I'm, you know, within I, range. Yeah. So I mean, when it comes to asteroids, we're just finding them more and more places. We're realizing that the ones that aren't metallic, which is most of them, uh, are rubble piles. It appears covered in boulders, uh, and that the biggest of them are actually big enough to have fancy pants geology, such that you actually have differentiation of the substances and geological processes taking place at the surface. Well, so and, let me just stop you for one second then. I mean, you talk about these sort of this idea of these rubble piles. So like, you yes. know, the, the traditional artwork of an asteroid is this ball of rock with maybe some craters on it, but it is a clearly, you know, a potato that is, you know, a space potato. But is that the case now? Or is it more that it is just like a bunch of loose rock and material that's happened to come together under its shared gravity. It's it's looking more and more like it may not always be a rubble pile, but that it is often multiple objects that once were one big object got split apart by something horrible happening and then just kind of real recongealed. And 
and gravity is now holding these multiple objects loosely together. And this is kind of cool. And perhaps we need to change our analogy from uh, potatoes to, I don't know about you, but I periodically plant bulbs in my yard. And a few years later, these bulbs are like a cluster of 10 bulbs because I've neglected them. And so you pull out one tulip and you find it would rather be 10 tulips. Just as those flower bulbs are all held together with roots and dirt, but you can shake them apart and then end up with 10 different flowers. These asteroids are a variety of different objects held together through structural binding the same way any rock is held together. And you end up with multiple of these rocks tied together through dirt between them and the gravitational pull of these different parts towards one another. And fortunately, there's going to be room for us to have another episode exactly like this in about 10, you know, in 10 more years. Yeah. I hope um, NASA is working on a mission to send a spacecraft to a metal asteroid, asteroid Psyche, which they think might be the the remnant core of a planetesimal and all that's left is this nickel iron chunk of metal out in space that the that the spacecraft is, is going to visit which is going to be completely fascinating and completely different from places like Ceres and and Vesta it's uh, I'm really you know of all the missions out there that are in the works right now that's one of the ones that I'm most excited about and and we can't forget Osiris Rex which because it's in space is no longer dead to me uh, which <laughs> we should do an update on that spacecraft at some point well it's Let's it's wait going for to... It to get its sample yeah then. so it's going to get to Bennu in way less than 10 years so we're hopefully yeah. going to have updates in the next year or two and or we saw multiple it we saw it launch you and I got to be there face yep. to face so yeah um lots of new science and then once lsst is up and running it's going to be one of its primary missions is to find all the things that might try and kill us right. which is a good thing for yeah. a telescope to do well let's talk about some comments okay and of course i mean again you know before we had done you know 10 years of astronomy cast episodes again i'm sure comets was like episode number six or whatever yeah i'm not looking through the history right now but because of course we went after the low-hanging fruit uh, yes there has been the rosetta mission to 67p and a lander attempting to land on a comet there's been a tremendous amount of of scientific understanding of a comet up close stardust mission receiving flying through the tail of a comet lots of great science and, and there had been missions that went to planets before. Uh, one of the things that greatly amused me is it turns out they have nicknamed the small flock of spacecraft that all went to visit Comet Haley back in 1984, the Haley Armada. That was a new one to me while I was prepping yep. for this show. Um, in addition to that, we also had a spacecraft that went to the wild, the, I don't know if it's actually pronounced wild or if there's like some different like veal. Yeah, I think so. Okay. But yeah, but who um, knows? Yeah. So there's a whole group of comets that have now been visited, sometimes touched um, with Comet Veald, it, no, sorry, with Asteroid, with Comet, yes, I can speak, with Comet uh, 81P Veald, it it was um, another close encounter. And as we visit these different objects, it gives us um, new information every single time. We've also started visiting asteroids. There was, I believe, a Japanese mission that just kind yeah. of Hayabusa. settled. Yeah. And now Hayabusa and, too. And, and we have amazing data of Itakawa that shows us that it is as near as I can describe um, boulders all the way down. You look at it and it's just, it looks like a load of rocks that you'd get to fill your garden, just imaged really up close. Um, so we, we're getting concrete results. And I think the most awesome thing and the saddest thing was the Philae lander. Mm -hmm. We, we've gotten a little bit of extra data we didn't know about in the moment that shows us that it touched down and it was able to get these amazing images that could be strung together into video of all of the debris flying around once it got to the surface. 
but since its harpoons didn't deploy correctly and as far as it was concerned it only weighed as much as a piece of paper on earth um, well it was as easy to move around as a piece of paper and in that dynamic environment uh, it bounced and moved and we didn't get the data we hoped for yeah yeah it's and that would have been really i mean the the rosetta mission alone and the kinds of images that we got from the spacecraft were amazing and and to be able to see these features these cliffs and these boulders and these uh, they look like like sand dunes and just all kinds of things on the surface of this of this world of this comet yeah. this chunk of ice and this dirty snowball um <laughs> But that would have been the greatest, right? To have that lander get down, get down to the surface, harpoon in and take some pictures from the surface and look out into space from the surface of 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 the comet and we didn't get that. And and unfortunately two separate systems failed to get it down there. And so we'll try again, I guess. Yeah. It it kind of reminds me of the Huygens probe. We got this taste of what a completely alien environment is like. We got this tantalizing taste that we looked at and we could recognize because with with Titan, it was like they were landing in the Mississippi Delta. With with the uh, file data, it looked like a bad day in Antarctica. Um, we're getting these tastes of how geology works the same on every world it's just the details that differ because you have a different gravitational value you have a different atmosphere but physics really is the same and geophysics really is the same no matter where you look we need to land on all the things all the things all the things yeah like it, you're exactly right we get these just this glimpse to see what it was like on titan or to see what it was like with with the rosetta mission We've got the, you know, the the close up look of asteroid asteroid Bennu when Osiris Rex tries to grab its sample and bring it home. That's going to yes. be awesome. So that yes. that we want to see. But uh, but now I had a chance to interview Alan Stern and, and David Grinspoon for their new book. And we talked about landers. Wouldn't that yeah. be amazing to have a lander on the surface of Pluto? As long as it's delivered by something that, that does the like lunar reconnaissance orbiter or Mars reconnaissance orbiter, high resolution imaging of the entire surface. So I believe strongly in partnering rovers with orbiting yes, spacecraft. Course. That's the way you go. You go flyby, orbiter, lander, rover. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. But like with the Viking mission, you can go orbiter, lander. So. And, and what I don't think a lot of people realize is these orbiters are often the communications relays for the rovers. And so it's a perfect partnership. It saves you electricity on, on your rover and uh, lets you get all that cool uh, contextual imagery of where you're exploring. I have one thing to just go back to asteroids for a second, which was within the last year, astronomers discovered an asteroid from another star system. Yes, Oumuamua. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's the most fun name as well. Who doesn't like to say Oumuamua? Yeah. It just feels fun. Uh, yeah, there was essentially a cigar-shaped space, not spacecraft, a cigar-shaped <laughs> asteroid. Freudian slip that, there, yeah. It was that, a... It was a uh, rendezvous with Rama shape. Yeah, yeah. It, and every time I look at it, that's exactly where my brain goes. Uh, but its orbit is consistent with it coming from somewhere else. And it had a shape like nothing we've ever seen before. And trying to explain it, and we'll never see it again unless like, we build advanced technologies and run it down later. Um, in our lifetimes, we'll never see it again. And it's amazing to see something that you never knew could exist. And it's so, so frustrating that uh, we didn't catch it before its closest approach to Earth because there could have been more data and all we want is more data. And now that people have discovered this one, people have been running these calculations, and it's thought that there could be at any time about 30,000 of these interstellar asteroids passing through the solar system right now. And we just, 
there's the so much space sky. is so big. Yeah, yeah, it's so big. But the chances are we're going to dig up another one and another one and another one. And there's even some plans like you could you could take a Falcon Heavy, put a tiny little spacecraft on it, and catch up with one of these interstellar asteroids and then study it up close, which again would just be a stunning accomplishment in in science. We so. need to run down a muamua. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, you still can if you really yeah. want to right now with ion engines and and a really powerful launcher and every day that goes by it gets harder and harder and it takes going to take longer yeah. and longer to catch up with it. You know, yeah. if you just like launched within the next year or two, you could catch up with it in no, I don't know, 30 or 40 years. But and it's not going to happen. No, it's of course it's not going to happen. <laughs> but maybe you know, we can be ready for the next time this happens. All right. Yes. Well, let's talk about Kuiper Belt objects. I mean, we've talked about what happened with New Horizons and and Pluto in the past, but sort of what do we know now about about Kuiper Belt objects? That they are more diverse than we had ever imagined. We are finding them in all different colors. We are finding them uh, in a variety of elliptical orbits that all point in one direction. So there's hints of another world that is a couple of times bigger than our own Earth, if the maths are right, yes. and potentially even bigger. And so now by studying the orbits of the largest of the Kuiper Belt objects that are in the weirdest of the orbits, we're getting indications that maybe we captured a world, maybe we just flung it out during the early days of our solar system into this impossibly elliptical orbit that apparently was possible. And um, I just love that we've gotten to the point that we can now say Kuiper Belt objects come in all colors from fresh, shiny, shiny surface to completely covered in uh, the universe's equivalent of road dirt on snow in the winter. Uh, from saying that some of them are in pretty circular orbits, there's a lot of them surrounding uh, Neptune in different kinds of resonances to, wow, there's a bunch of them that go from hundreds of AUs out to thousands of AUs that are all aligned kind of in one way. And how do we explain this? And the way we do it is by adding another planet to our solar system. Yeah. And in fact, I don't know if you'd seen someone had done some research into whether you could detect, get more data about where this could be by looking at like paintings. Tapestries. Yeah. And tapestries. Yeah. That was when amazing. Comets had made close approaches to the to the earth and then you could use that to sort of extrapolate back to see if you could use that as a way to find out when uh objects had moved you know where where planet nine could be but but it looks like and we're actually working on, on an article on this right now with with universe today that that the lsst the large synoptic survey telescope which of course you know i i want to marry that telescope um is going to be the tool that's going to be able to find it. It's going to be searching the entire night sky, night after night after night. It's going to be the one that's going to turn up all of these new objects. So we're just a couple unless, of years away now. Unless Gaia gets there first. Unless Gaia gets there first, right, of course, which I I also want to marry that. <laughs> too. So anyway, um, I'm sure that's legal. Uh, so, so I cannot wait for all of the data that's going to come from the LSST and Gaia and, you know, merge that together. And we're going to find so much about yes. the night sky. What other, what are some other new things that we've learned about Kuiper Belt objects? I, well, Pluto taught us they can have geology and Sharon reinforced that. And so we're tr still trying to figure out all the possible ways uh, that Pluto ended up with a, uh, subsurface ocean, um, because while it and Sharon do interact, it doesn't seem like it should be quite enough energy to do the things that we're seeing. But whichever theorist's theory you choose to believe, what we know is the best way to explain what we see on Pluto is that there's a subsurface ocean. Yeah. And, and, and this, I mean, like, We've gone from the best place to look for life in the in the solar system is Mars. Yes. To the best place to look for life in the solar system is going to be these icy moons around Jupiter and and Saturn, you know, Europa and Enceladus mm -hmm. and maybe Callisto. 
maybe. And now we've gone to, oh, turns out there are these icy worlds and there are probably subsurface oceans across maybe all of them, all the dwarf planets, all of the icy moons of the of the outer solar system, that there could be life on, on a thousand worlds under yeah. the oceans of all of these places that there is uh, there was this great research that that um by avi Loeb, and he calculated there's about a thousand times more worlds ice worlds and water worlds than yeah. there are terrestrial rocky planets like like the earth that 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 is those are the places that life could have had all the different chances to to grow and unfortunately, they're going to be really hard to explore. Yeah, no, it, it's true. And this is really, we now, I think, can say there's the Goldilocks zone, which is that area around a star that the temperature is just right, that a regular everyday world that doesn't have a greenhouse effect and has enough magnetic field to hold on to its atmosphere is capable of being at the triple point of water and sustaining life. Um, but it's no longer okay to call that the habitable zone because habitable has been expanded to be wherever the geology has said, let there be a solvent, let there be a energy gradient and let there be nutrients. Yeah. And, and so many more places. Yes. It's a great universe out there. It really is. All right. Well, and I can't wait for us to have this update in another, you know, 10 years or so again, <laughs> because there, there will be the potentially, you know, we're going to find about about asteroid, asteroid Bennu. Uh, there's potentially the Psyche mission. Uh, New Horizons will have flown past its second Kuiper Belt object even closer, and that's going to be mm. happening in just about six months. It, it's flown past many Kuiper Belt objects. It's going to fly, fly close. It's going close. Yeah, way closer that's, than Pluto. That's the amazing yeah. part. And I don't think enough people know that. Yeah. And we need to have like a watch party when this happens. Yeah, yeah. That'll be great. All right. Well, uh, next week, what have we got queued up for next week, Pamela? I. Uh, some other update why don't we why don't we do an update on uh mars and then wend our way through the solar system that sounds great all right we'll see you next week bye-bye and you you stay for questions now it was just the podcast that we're bye bye yeah. we're gonna save our files and then add us your questions that's awesome i mean uh, we can do there's like the number remaining is perfect yeah 492 we can talk about the sun too if we want the moon okay we, we and sadly we don't have any information about Uranus and and, and you you need to pop onto the weekly space hangout crew and join our conversation about the 500th yes we're gonna do something special for the 500th episode go to wshcrew.space and uh they will absorb you into the hive mind yes all right let me just save and export, and then we will have the conversation. Uh, and for any Sorry. of you who uh, are following along on our Twitch channels, um, we'd love to know over at CosmoQuest what Fraser and I are not already giving you between all of our different media. <laughs> What do you want now? What's what, yeah, what else? exactly, what exactly. Tell help? us, yes. Yeah. Arjun wants to know can we tell if there's an active ocean by seeing if a large canyon like Sharon's has developed yet? Seeing the canyon as the end of subsurface oceans, no. So, the problem with canyons, and this, this is actually something that we learned from Mars, is if you have a massive volcano in one place the formation of that massive volcano can lead to rift zones and rift zones and canyons are in many ways, the exact same critter. Mm -hmm. um, so canyons are generally formed through the flow of water. Rift zones are formed by the land splitting apart. But if the land splits apart, water's gonna get in there. <sighs> so it appears that uh, Valles Marineris uh, on Mars is a rift zone. Yes. Sort of like we currently have in Ethiopia. 
Right. It's sort of the the remnant of the Tharsis bulge area, like all of those volcanoes building up that one area kind of cracked the surface of Mars in that in that other area. Um, the I'm trying to think we talked a bit about that on on Monday with Alan Stern, and he was talking a bit about that canyon on on Sharon and sort of how it came about. Um, but I forget his exact answer. So you should, I, you should just go and watch that. Yes. Um, Ghost World says, lol, we demand more. Can you say lol? If someone says lol, yeah. do you say lol? Do you say laugh out loud? Or do you just laugh? <laughs> we demand more. I usually more. say lol. Lol. But I'm an American. Yeah. This could be one of those globular globular things. <laughs> You, it's, it's too late. You guys have already infected my brain. Now you've got me saying <laughs> lava, too. So wait, how else could you say that? Lava, obviously, like pasta, and llama. <sighs> Ask your husband. Watch him do it too. Okay. Yeah, he will say it I, the way I do too. Probably, unless it's just me and like the only person. Apparently, well, he says spaghetti instead of pasta. <laughs> oh, see, so he doesn't even say the word. Um, uh, Nichols of the Yard, are we due to see any spectacular naked eye comments anytime in the near future? No. Uh. Well, it's it's really, we don't know. And generally, in general, we find them either when they start to get interesting or only a few months before they get interesting. So, yeah. We, we, Got a, a double feature back in the 90s with Hale Bop and Yakitaki yeah. in 96 and, and 97. Us. Totally spoiled us. And and so we're due for another awesome one. Um, but, I mean, it's it's not like probability works that way. We feel that we are entitled <laughs> totally. to another. Yeah. 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 But being and we entitled... thought we had it with Comet Ison and it was a no-show. So, Yeah. And which was the one that self-destructed on the backside of the sun? That was Ison. The thanks that was Ison. Yeah. The Thanksgiving Day yeah. self-destructing. Yep. Yeah. And that was going to be the comet of the century, and then it just got torn apart because it was going to go past the sun. It was going to get, you know, sort of. Uh, it was going to expand outward, and then it was going to pass close to, to the Earth in orbit, and we would get a beautiful view. But instead, it just passed around the back of the sun and just got shredded and that was that yeah we had a puff ball of yep. vaguely reflective stuff come yeah. out the other side yeah. the thanksgiving day comet that wasn't uh paul gracie wants to know why is there no water in Valles marinaire because the uh, atmosphere at the surface of mars is so incredibly thin that if you put an ice cube out the ice will go straight from solid to sublimating into the atmosphere and water uh, is completely non-stable and um, basically boils away into the atmosphere instantly. So because the surface of the planet at this point in Mars history has such a thin atmosphere, it can't support any form of water at its surface. In the past, it had a much thicker atmosphere. Uh, this meant that you could have liquid water, you could have um, ice on the surface without having it like locked in with other stuff that keeps it cold. Like at the poles, we have dry ice and things like that. Um, unfortunately, Mars is no longer capable of sustaining water. It can't under the dirt, just not at the surface. Uh, Nicholas B. asks, could radioactivity account for the increased geologic activity? On Earth? I need a world. Well, I guess the impression that I'm getting is, like, can radioactivity help keep these these ice worlds melted? Yes, yes. So there are papers out there. I don't think they're currently the dominant theory, but there are papers out there that try and explain Pluto by saying it has a higher concentration of nuclearly active materials inside of it than other worlds have. And it's the decay of these particles and decay processes release heat that is creating the subsurface ocean. As I said, I don't think that's a dominant theory right now. Uh, here on our own planet Earth, inside the planet is warmer than you would expect strictly from sunlight, given how old we are. Right. And that excess heat is coming from 
uh, radioactive processes and we see the child products of some of those processes if you live near granite and your basement is full of radon. Also, check this if your basement is near granite. Right. Watch it. Search for the radon. Uh, yes. Ken Fox wants to know what's going to happen to the Parker Solar Probe after its final orbit of the planned mission. I don't know. Ask Congress. Right. But, but once it gets into its final orbit, it's going theoretically going to go as long as it lasts, right? There's no right. reason why it's going to drift out of its orbit yes. or fall into the sun yes. or run out of, you know, it's got all, no, the, that, it's that's got all, all the energy it needs, all the solar so, power. Sorry, I, I misunderstood this as um, it has a certain number of orbits that science has been planned for because we plan orbits. Um, and the last planned orbit what happens to the mission after the last planned orbit. Uh, if the spacecraft is still healthy, they will probably go through the uh, senior review process, ask for an extension on the mission. We've seen this with Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter happen quite successfully. We saw this happen with Cassini quite successfully. So we try and use spacecraft until spacecraft are like, and I'm out. <laughs> but yeah. we do occasionally see still useful missions that get retired. This happened to the WISE mission, which got boosted into a higher parking orbit where it hung out being stable in until it recently got adopted, and I'm not remembering who adopted it. Was the it. Neo Wise? It was Amy Mainzer, wasn't it? From and is yes. the, is the PI, and that's yes. so it was NASA. Um, and they changed it to Neo Wise, and they used it to find asteroids once it had sort of finished yeah. its main mission. And and so we do look to find ways to creatively keep spacecraft going. Uh, we did this with the Kepler two mission, um, but sometimes NASA's because Congress gives them such a limited budget, has to pull the plug on telescopes and spacecraft. And uh, this is, I can't tell you what the fate of a mission is going to be until Congress tells us what the fate of the budget is right. going to be. Uh, Scott Bragdon asked, um, could there be large amounts of frozen water underground on Mars? Yes. Not, well... Depend Not only could there for, be, there absolutely is. And and it it I have to put the quantification in. It depends on your definition of large. Mars does not have massive subsurface frozen oceans. What it does have is significant water tied in to the minerals and stuff that makes up the world. And this is detected um, through uh, neutrons that are getting released when uh, high energy particles from the sun penetrate the surface. Well, they've also seen though an ice layer on Mars that that extends quite significantly down from the from the poles that is several yes. meters thick. And there's some great pictures taken from the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter where it's seeing the side of a crater and it's seeing this this sort of layer of ice that's that's in the that's sort of in the regolith. And you can imagine future Mars colonists, they would, you know, clear off the material on top of this, and then they could just live on the on the below this and you could have like a skylight made of ice. On oh, I'm way more creative than that. It I don't know if you've ever had a chance to visit Mesa Verde or any of the old uh, Anasazi uh, archaeological ruins in the United States. But in the past, we actually had cliff dwelling uh, indigenous peoples who would build the most amazing cities into the sandstone. So you'll be looking at a cliff face and in one of these hollows that's generally formed by the wind, they build cities into these hollows. And so in my mind, we have cities built into the sides of the craters. So they're protected from the cosmic rays above and they have the water to, to live. Right. Uh, Kyrton Savre, how do you say the little A E at the same time? What is the way? It's to... like it, it's the way you say it in demon, because that's Damon, supposed to be in... like Damon? yeah, like okay, yeah, Savre. You have to tell me. Uh, did you hear about the massive fail that Hubble's watching the supernova that blinked out? At least that's what they they are seeing. That I so I've, I've read. Heard, a story... I know a bit about this. Okay, yeah. is it different from the one that failed in the past and then resupernovaed later? No, um, maybe, uh, but but the 
you know, who knows? There's great a lot response. Of, well, great there's, response. Well, there's a lot of this, this news, right? But, <laughs> yes. the, but the gist is that now it really appears like there is a class of supernova that where they fail. So the supernova gets going and then the core collapse happens and the whole thing sucks itself inside into a black hole and then just disappears from view. So it doesn't go kaboom. It just goes, it just implodes and it's gone. And there's and there are these ideas called failed supernova or unnova is is sort of a terminology that that people are using now for them. I know you're I googling need to it learn right more now. More about this. Yeah. So to look at unnova, and that's what it is. It is a supernova just going poop and it's gone. Okay, that is not the article I was talking about. Uh, there's also a class. Maybe it's too early to say a class. There are stars. And we don't know enough about them to say that they're the same kind of stars in these different situations that do what looks like a supernova. Yeah. And then you look back at the exact same place later and it's like supernova again. It's like yeah. these things, it, how? And and this is where we start to have to consider things like Eta Carina, which is the brightest star in the southern hemisphere where in the 1800s it suddenly became the brightest star in the entire sky for a little while faded back out like mm -hmm. you expect from a nova and uh now we're waiting for it to go kaboom in its death supernova instead of its i'm just gonna play with your minds nova <laughs> these are cool um John Seffel asks, I read recently that a particular globular cluster, see, you did it to me, could be at the heart of a small galaxy that was eaten or absorbed by our own. Is it possible that all globular clusters are the remains of small galaxies? No. And and the reason I say that so deterministically is uh, so objects like the object I studied for my master's thesis, the Ursa Minor Dwarf Sorrel Galaxy, these are small galaxies that have roughly the same mass as some globular clusters. So the biggest globular clusters and the smallest dwarf sorrel galaxies start to overlap in masses of visible objects, of visible is the key to that. Globular clusters, as near as we can tell, are 10% or less composed of dark matter, whereas dwarf galaxies have the highest ratio of dark matter to luminous matter that we've ever seen, where the dark matter dwarfs the luminous matter. So here we are looking at two completely different dark matter to luminous matter ratios. Now there is work that looks at the velocities of the stars in the spheroids of, of galaxies that have a clear spheroid versus globular clusters. And you start to see that the globular clusters do fall on that continuum but it's a continuum where you can see perhaps a globular cluster more as a failed galaxy than a leftover bit of a galaxy. You'd expect it to look different if it right, was a leftover right. bit. Um, and the kinematics of globular clusters are radically different from the kinematics of dwarf galaxies. So and different critters. They are as old as the galaxy itself. Well, the ones we have, we do see younger globular clusters in other places okay. we think yeah um there was another question and now you have a disney song stuck in my head <laughs> um ryan schmitz wants to know will we do a astronomy cast broadcast for the new horizons flyby on new year's <laughs> um if fraser's not game i'll do something on twitch and maybe i can have fraser join join me on twitch because i am a loser Oh, <laughs> so it turns out I usually end up spending New Year's working because I'm prepping for the American Astronomical Society meeting, yeah. uh, which inevitably starts three or four days later. So um, I'm game to do crazy stuff like this. It's yeah. I mean, we've done we did the landing of the Curiosity rover and, yeah. you know, maybe we'll do something on the landing of InSight. It's yeah. Uh, it's a new sort of landscape now of lots of and, and NASA and SpaceX do such a great job yeah. of actually doing their own coverage that it's you feel guilty sort of overlapping what they're doing. And back in the past, it was more like there wasn't a lot of like when we did the Curiosity landing, there wasn't a lot of great, really great coverage that mm -hmm. was going on. And so we did this great party and we brought on all these special guests 
body and it was a lot of fun so we'll see it was a lot of fun yeah. and i i recently covered over on twitch the insight launch and the reason i did that was because with insight it had about two and a half hours of things going on with lulls in between uh because it had to keep firing its engines to get into the right orbit to head off on this direct course that we've never done before that I know of, so I could be wrong, that we've never done before that I know of to get to Mars on a fast path rather than using one of these very energy conserving um, uh, Haldeman transfer orbits. Uh, Elit Avron asks, could a star in a binary system survive its companion going nova? Yes, we've actually seen yeah. one of those recently. Yeah, it just happened. So we didn't know. And I wonder if this was like a leading question and you knew this. But <laughs> but this had just this was just observed within the last couple of weeks. Yeah. So yes, they found a, a supernova years ago, like 17 years ago or something like that. And then they found the companion star not dead yes and and to our juan who's uh pointing out that i'm a jet setter i go everywhere that doesn't mean i'm not a loser when i'm home oh. um so i live in a super small to me because i'm from boston i live in a town of about twenty four thousand in the midwest and i'm 45 minutes from the nearest urban center and um I tend to be a homebody and we tend to not put a lot of effort into holidays because really both of us just want to do art. Um, so, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, but ben Appleby asks, is there any more news on the black hole event horizon image? No. no. That's it. Sorry. Um, Murat Obat. O. Davasi asks, is the likelihood of another Earth-like planet occurring going up, down, or forward? Uh, of course we're going to find more Earth-like planets. We're just not going to find one identical to Earth because the universe likes to taunt us. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we talked about uh, this a bit in our extrasolar planets update episode. Yeah. The loss of Kepler, like Kepler was the machine that would have found Earth 2.0, would have found the the sun-like star, the, the Earth-like planet in the habitable zone of this star, and then it died. And it died too soon. And yes. our best possible chance to find this. And then Kepler had to switch to these red dwarf stars, which are fascinating, but they're not the Earth 2.0 that we're, that we're really hoping for. And yeah. there isn't, I mean, there is the test, well, test mission, right? And the test mission is going to turn up a tremendous number of planets. There's the Gaia mission, but then there's going to need to be follow-up observations. And so really our chance to find Earth 2.0 was kicked back, I would say a decade or more with the loss of, with, of the Kepler spacecraft. Well, and, and it's, the future is, is unknowable well, it's always unknowable. It's particularly frustrating right now because TESS was designed with Hubble launch, not Hubble, with James Webb launching this year to do follow-up. And James Webb has been slipping. And to be fair, James Webb is trying to design new technology that has never existed before. And you never know how long it's going to take to invent something. Yes. Um, I'm sure Edison thought he'd have a light bulb a whole lot faster yeah. than he actually yeah. did. I didn't figure out how to build the most powerful telescope ever made. I developed 1,000 most powerful telescopes that failed. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. This is a – yeah, don't get me started on James Webb. <laughs> I, f I feel fear and excitement and anticipation and understanding and rage. All these – I have all these feelings. That's how I feel about Lisa, because I've Lisa oh, is why I'm yeah. mad at LIGO. But but with Lisa, <laughs> at least you've got the the just outrageously successful Lisa demonstrator that that finished yeah. its you know its mission and turned out that it's going to be a lot more sensitive than they had ever imagined. And so when you think about the Lisa mission and you just are like it's just so feels like it's just so far in the future. 
at least the they've got a mission that went up to test out the technologies. It's as if yeah. they took some of the technology they were going to put in James Webb and they flew it to go, oh, okay, yeah, we can, uh, you know, fold out a telescope in space. We can have a sun shield. We can have this kind of infrared cooling, be it a Lagrange point, like all of these yeah. pieces, right? And and that seemed like in retrospect, what they did with the Lisa Pathfinder mission was was a really good way to go about it. And... All I well, feel is fear and, and and panic about James Webb. And we used to have more hope, uh, at least some of us who beat both the astronomy drum and the journalism drum, because in the early years of James Webb work, I remember talking to folks from Northrop Grumman and a bunch of journalists noticed the same thing. And initially they always used future verb tenses and then after a few years, they started using past tense verb tenses when talking about um, the technologies. And there was a rumor, strictly a rumor. I'm sharing a rumor that gave me hope that was apparently false hope. There was a rumor among uh, drunk and conspiring journalists that Northrop Grumman had built spy satellites using the same technologies, oh, uh, the same umbrella and so technology. They knew how to do this. And so thinking that perhaps there were top secret missions that tested this technology it was much more hopeful mm. and the more and years pass by the potential I know, of james uh, webb scale telescopes doing <laughs> earth observation well yeah um i wasn't thinking it was james webb scale we were all thinking they were probably well, smaller well remember the but... w first right was going to, was a was a hubble class <laughs> telescope that was just thrown yeah. out you know in a, at a garage sale from the air force and there were two of them and there were two of them and like these are garbage yes. we don't need these anymore yeah we should wrap things up we've reached the end of our hour yes. so um i want to specifically a huge thank you to uh, the folks over in the WSH crew who have been taking yeah. questions coming from the YouTube chat and bringing them into the live stream as well. Thank you so yes, much for doing this. Thanks. Um, that is great to have them all in one location. And it is, you just, again, just the best partners we could possibly have. So yes. if you want to join this wonderful community, go to wshcrew.space and they will hook you up. All right. Yes. Well, we should wrap things up. Pamela, as always, thank you so much for bringing the brain. Thanks to our fans for watching us live. Uh, what's the next thing that a person should see that you're going to do? I am going to be painting planets tomorrow on the internet while talking about uh, Kuiper Belt objects, icy moons, icy asteroids. Uh, that will start at 4 p.m. Eastern, which is... Uh, 9 p.m. London, 1 p.m. Pacific. Uh, and then I've started a new show that does a quick 15-minute roundup of everything that's new in the news Monday through Friday at 1 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. London, uh, 10 a.m. Pacific. And this gives you a quick preview of all the things you can learn about in depth on the weekly space hangout on Wednesday with uh, Morgan and Fraser. And I can't remember her name other than I want to say the initials. Yes, Kimberly Cartier. Um, I could remember the K and the C so, and I just couldn't remember anything else. Um, and on Monday, I'm going to be uh, having my live QA and uh, Dr. Paul Sutter is going to join me and we're going to yak about really whatever you guys want to talk about. And I'm Life is good. Sounds good. All right. Thanks, Pamela. We'll see you guys all next week. Bye-bye.